NATO, the European Union, and the United States continue to embrace a strategic direction that says we want to strategically defeat Russia. You can't. And if you did, you'd die. Because if you ever strategically defeated Russia as a nuclear power, they would use their nuclear weapons to prevent their defeat. That's just the way it rocks, baby. And yet, that's what Ukraine wants. That's the direction they want to go. It's a suicide pill. Uh, it's an unrealistic policy. It's an irresponsible policy. And I think there's a growing recognition in the United States of that. But so much political capital has been put into propping up Ukraine that we are, and this is what I believe the strategic decision has been made, they know Ukraine's lost the war. And they know that there's not much we can do to, you know, resolve that situation, salvage it. In fact, there's nothing we can do. So Ukraine's going to sink, and we're going to be seen throwing life preservers into the water. That's it. We're going to say we did everything we could to help, and we were there to save them in the end, but that ship's going down with the crew, with the captain. It's gone, and that's the reality. Ukraine is gone. It's not going to survive this winter. It, whatever comes out rolling into the spring is going to have to unconditionally surrender to Russia. That's the reality. If they survive now, I mean, the Russians are in the process of destroying the Ukrainian military on the battlefield. Scott Ritter's sharp critique of NATO's, the European Union's, and the United States' strategic approach to the conflict in Ukraine is both a stark warning and an uncomfortable reality check. His comments delve into the inherent dangers of trying to strategically defeat a nuclear power like Russia, and they highlight what Ritter sees as an inevitable outcome, Ukraine's collapse. Let's take a deeper look into Ritter's points, starting with his most powerful assertion. Why the notion of strategically defeating Russia is not only unrealistic, but also deeply dangerous for the West. From there, we'll explore Ukraine's current position, the West's political commitments, and the grim outlook Ritter has for Ukraine's future. Ritter's core argument revolves around a single, undeniable fact. Russia is a nuclear power. To strategically defeat Russia, as NATO and the U.S. claim they aim to do, is not simply a matter of pushing them back on the battlefield. It's a much more dangerous proposition. Nuclear-armed nations do not face existential defeat without resorting to the ultimate deterrent, their nuclear arsenal. Throughout the Cold War, the entire premise of NATO's strategy toward the Soviet Union was based on deterrence. Neither side wanted to risk a confrontation that could lead to mutual destruction. The doctrine of mutually assured destruction MAD, kept the peace between nuclear powers for decades. The idea was simple. If either side launched a nuclear strike, both sides would be destroyed in the resulting exchange. Now, as Ritter points out, NATO seems to be edging dangerously close to ignoring that hard-earned lesson. The idea of strategically defeating Russia without triggering a catastrophic nuclear response is, as he calls it, a suicide pill. It's a policy built on unrealistic expectations and wishful thinking. Why, then, has the West committed so heavily to Ukraine's cause, knowing the potential dangers of pushing Russia into a corner? One of the key points Ritter makes is about the vast amount of political capital the U.S. and its allies have poured into supporting Ukraine. Since the war began, the West has provided Ukraine with billions of dollars in military aid, equipment, training, and intelligence. The narrative pushed by Western governments has been that Ukraine is not only defending its sovereignty but also standing on the front lines of a larger battle between democracy and authoritarianism. However, Ritter argues that this commitment has gone beyond a point of reason. Despite knowing that Ukraine's war against Russia is unwinnable, at least in the sense of pushing Russia out of all occupied territories, the West continues to funnel resources into the conflict. Why? Part of the answer lies in domestic politics. Leaders in the U.S. and Europe have staked much of their credibility on supporting Ukraine. Backing down or admitting defeat would be politically costly. The perception of failure in Ukraine could weaken the leadership of key figures in Washington, Brussels, and other European capitals. So, they continue to prop up Ukraine, despite the growing realization that there is no military solution in sight. Ritter describes this situation as one where Ukraine is sinking, and the West is merely throwing life preservers into the water. There is no realistic hope of turning the tide of the war, but Western leaders are determined to maintain the appearance of doing everything they can to help Ukraine, even if it's ultimately futile. Ritter's bleak assessment of Ukraine's future rests on his analysis of the battlefield situation. According to him, 
Ukraine's military is being systematically dismantled by Russian forces. Despite the Western aid pouring in, Ukraine's army has been severely weakened by continuous fighting, equipment losses, and a lack of manpower. Russia, on the other hand, has shown a remarkable ability to adapt and endure. After the initial setbacks in the early months of the war, Russian forces have regrouped and shifted their strategy. They are now using their overwhelming advantage in artillery, air power, and logistics to grind down the Ukrainian military. The harsh winter ahead will only compound Ukraine's problems. Ritter argues that Ukraine's military is not going to survive the winter in any meaningful capacity. By spring, Whatever remains of Ukraine's fighting force will likely be forced into an unconditional surrender to Russian forces. This prediction stands in stark contrast to the more optimistic assessments often heard from Western officials and media outlets. But Ritter's warning should not be dismissed lightly. The war in Ukraine has taken a devastating toll on both sides, and without a significant shift in strategy, the outcome Ritter predicts may indeed come to pass. If Ukraine's defeat is as inevitable as Ritter suggests, what then is the U.S. strategy moving forward? According to Ritter, the U.S. is already preparing for a post-war scenario where Ukraine is no longer a viable state. In his words, the U.S. will be seen throwing life preservers as Ukraine sinks. This means that while the U.S. will continue to offer symbolic support to Ukraine, it will gradually shift its focus away from trying to salvage the situation. The U.S. government will likely frame its efforts as having done everything possible to help Ukraine, while ultimately blaming Russia for the destruction. The narrative will be one of noble sacrifice, of the U.S. and its allies standing by Ukraine until the bitter end, but unable to prevent the inevitable. This approach allows the U.S. to save face domestically and internationally, even as Ukraine collapses. But it raises important questions about the cost of such a policy. What happens to Ukraine after it falls? How will Europe deal with the fallout of a defeated and possibly fractured Ukraine on its doorstep? And what lessons will the West take away from this failed intervention? Once Ukraine is forced to surrender, the geopolitical landscape of Eastern Europe will be dramatically altered. Russia will have solidified its control over significant parts of Ukraine, and the West will be left to deal with the consequences of its failed policies. The most immediate concern will be the humanitarian crisis. Ukraine's population has already been devastated by the war, with millions displaced and entire cities reduced to rubble. If the Ukrainian government collapses, it's unclear what kind of political structure will emerge in its place. There's a possibility of further fragmentation, with pro-Russian factions taking control of some areas while others remain under the influence of Western-backed forces. For Europe, the economic and security implications are enormous. Ukraine has been a key buffer state between Russia and the rest of Europe. With that buffer gone, the risk of further instability along Europe's eastern borders will increase. There will also be economic fallout, as European countries that have invested heavily in Ukraine's future will now have to contend with the loss of those investments. And then there's the question of NATO. How will the alliance respond to the collapse of one of its key partners in eastern Europe? Will this lead to a re-evaluation of NATO's strategy, or will it prompt even more aggressive posturing toward Russia? Ritter's analysis suggests that the West is on the verge of a significant geopolitical failure in Ukraine. But the lessons of this conflict go far beyond Eastern Europe. The war in Ukraine should serve as a warning about the dangers of overcommitting to unwinnable conflicts, especially when nuclear powers are involved. The US and its allies must reconsider their approach to foreign interventions. Supporting allies is important, but doing so at the risk of provoking a nuclear-armed adversary is reckless. The West's policy of attempting to strategically defeat Russia was always fraught with danger, and now, as Ritter points out, the consequences of that policy are becoming painfully clear. As Ukraine sinks, the West must learn from its mistakes. It must find ways to engage with rivals like Russia without resorting to dangerous brinkmanship. The alternative is a world where conflicts like Ukraine become the norm, and where the risk of nuclear war grows ever larger. According to Scott Ritter, NATO, the European Union, and the United States continue to embrace a strategic direction that says we want to strategically defeat Russia. You can't. And if you did, you'd die because if you ever strategically defeated Russia as a nuclear power, they would use their nuclear weapons to prevent their defeat. That's just the way it rocks, baby. And yet, 
That's what Ukraine wants. That's the direction they want to go. It's a suicide pill. It's an unrealistic policy. It's an irresponsible policy. And I think there's a growing recognition in the United States of that. But so much political capital has been put into propping up Ukraine that we are. And this is what I believe the strategic decision has been made. They know Ukraine's lost the war. And they know there's not much we can do to resolve that situation or salvage it. In fact, there's nothing we can do. So Ukraine's going to sink, and we're going to be seen throwing life preservers into the water. That's it. We're going to say we did everything we could to help, and we were there to save them in the end. But that ship's going down. With the crew, with the captain. It's gone. And that's the reality. Ukraine is gone. It's not going to survive this winter. Whatever comes out rolling into the spring is going to have to unconditionally surrender to Russia. That's the reality, if they survive now. I mean, the Russians are in the process of destroying the Ukrainian military on the battlefield. Thanks for watching.